Hello and welcome to Think Imperial 2022. Um, this year is a very auspicious year for us because it's 25 years since the Faculty of Medicine at Imperial College was first formed. And um, what we're going to be doing today is going to be telling you a little bit about the postgraduate education space that we have uh, within the faculty. So my name is Lucky Bulawella and I have the pleasure of chairing today's event. I'm the Faculty of Medicine lead for doctoral degrees, so that's mostly PhDs. I'm the uh, uh, Deputy Director of the uh, college's uh, graduate school, and I'm also the Director of the Medical Research Council Doctoral Training Programme, uh, which uh, we now call MultiSci, and we'll, I'll be talking a little bit about that later on. So just to remind you that this is a MS Teams live event, so that means that your camera and microphone are not uh, um, available to you as an attendee. But what we do want you to do is to encourage you to use the Q&A panel um, for questions and comments. And this section will be moderated so you can submit questions if you want also anonymously if you wish to do so. In doing that, the rest uh, of the audience, please like questions that you want answered and the more likes that we have on the question, the higher priority we'll give it in terms of uh, being addressed by the, uh, the panel themselves. Um, I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Jeffrey Vernon, who's going to start us off by talking about postgraduate opportunities at Imperial College. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Thank you very much. Um, welcome everyone to our event and um, I'm going to be sharing with you in the next few minutes some information about our master's courses. So uh, it says postgraduate study opportunities. Later in the event we'll be talking about PhDs, but just for the moment I want to talk about master's programmes. And as you can see on the slide we have 28 programmes. Within those programmes we have a number of streams and I think that at the Faculty of Medicine we've got something for everyone. So I think everyone on the call will be interested in at least one of the programmes um, that we have. So um, let's see if I'm right. Can we go on to the next slide, please? Um, we have a thousand master students typically every year in our faculty. And one thing I want you to know is that we've got a very diverse community here. I think Imperial has a reputation for being a bit London, a bit elite. Um, it's very far from the truth. Uh, I think we are officially the most diverse university in the UK in terms of the nationality um, of our staff and students. So I don't want anyone to feel intimidated about applying because they think that we won't be a welcoming place. Next slide, please. Um, I can't resist bragging about this. We were the Sunday Times University of the Year in the UK in 1922. Every year, some university has got to be University of the Year. In, 1920, in 2022, it was us. And the Sunday Times noticed how prominent Imperial College was during the COVID pandemic. Very many of our experts were on telly and active in public life. But it also says in that small print on that yellow flash that we provided a pandemic learning experience that actually worked. Um, I think that's pretty close to the truth. Um, and I'll tell you a bit more about how that happened. Can we see the next slide, please? One thing to say is that before COVID happened and we were adapting to lockdown and online programmes, we'd already been thinking a lot about teaching and learning in Imperial and in our faculty in particular. And we'd had a very thoroughgoing curriculum review and we're doing what we now call an education transformation. I won't give you the details on that. But just to say we're not resting on our laurels, we're still thinking what can we do to enhance education and the student experience. And two very big facets of that in our faculty were what we call active learning. So that's the opposite of what you're doing now. You're looking at me talking on the screen. But active learning is time on task, learning by doing, um, doing things that consolidate your learning. An authentic assessment um, is about alternatives to the traditional three hour exam. We're trying to think of assessments that mimic 
or that mirror the kinds of things that scientists would actually do in their daily practice. So these two principles are at the heart of our, our pandemic learning experience and indeed what we've been trying to develop over the last four or five years. Next slide, please. I'm now going to share with you the programmes that we teach because I think you need to know what it is we're offering. And on this summary slide, um, I have grouped all of the programmes we provide into four themes, which you can see in my left hand column. These themes are completely unofficial, but I think they're quite helpful for you to see that the master's programmes we offer um, cover, if you like, all levels of organisation. So you can be thinking about the population or the environment, and then you can move inwards to the organism, you can go to the subcellular and microscopic level, and then you can be looking at the level of computer bits and, and data. And in the right hand column, I've listed the number of programs we have in each of those themes. So let's look at what those themes are like. Can we see the next slide, please? So this is theme one that I call patients, populations, environment. There is no difference between these two columns. I've colored them slightly differently just for contrast. Um, what I do want you to know is that the programmes shown in bold are either completely online or they have a very high level of blended content. So if it suits you to do an online or blended programme, you can see um, some of the programmes that we have in that area. All the other programmes are on campus. Um, and I'm not going to read them all out to you. You can look at them and I think you can see that there's quite a wide variety of programmes to do with um, clinical app applications and also public health, things of that nature. Next slide, please. Theme two is what I've called health disease and resistance, and all these programmes in a way are about the organism, its normal function, what goes wrong in the event of injury or disease or, or trauma. And um, the top line of this um, table um, shows you the MRES programme in biomedical research. I'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment. And the bottom line is the translational neuroscience programme. In between, you can see a number of programmes to do with you know, the physiology of the organism and, and what goes wrong in disease. Can we see the next slide, please? Um, so I've just expanded the translational neuroscience programme because I'd like you to know there are two streams within that. One focusing on the imaging and computational sides of neuroscience and the other one more at the level of um, disease and injury. Um, next slide, please. And the biomedical research MRES is actually an umbrella programme um, students who don't know what they want to study can apply just to do biomedical research. You may already have an idea that you're interested in one of the, um, the other streams within the biomedical research program. So you may be interested in data science or the microbiome, and then you can apply for that program directly. Um, but you can see that biomedical research um, is a very broad program. Next slide, please. And finally, my last two themes um, on the left hand side, a list of programmes where, you know, genes and molecules recur. These are all distinct programmes, even though they have in some cases overlapping titles. Um, and theme four was the one that where we look at computers, robots, um, sequencing chemistries and things of that sort. So that's a very swift tour through the four themes and all the programmes that we offer within them. And as I said at the beginning, I think everyone on the programme should be interested in at least one of those, if not more. Can we move to the next slide, please? Um, I do want to emphasise the research projects, a big thing in our master's programme. So whether you're talking about um, MSc, MRes or Master of Public Health, Depending on the programme, you could be doing your project for four to nine months. And in fact, looking at my slide there, some in some of the MRES programmes, you are starting your project 
almost as soon as you arrive. So 10, 11 months might be closer. Um, and within an MRES program, you might be doing one, two or three rotations. We're able to support this level of um, ambitious in master's level projects because we've got over 600 staff in the faculty and we've got 195 million pounds of research funding this year. That doesn't sound like much if you say it quick, but um, I can assure you that's a very generous level of funding for, for, for a medicine faculty. Next slide, please. Um, and just to say we have partners, so our research students, some of them can go to the Francis Crick Institute, which is a um, big research station in North London at King's Cross. And some of our master students can uh, undertake one or more of their projects at the Francis Crick. This is competitive. I can't promise that everybody can go to the Crick, but um, we do offer a number of programmes there each year. And of course, we partner with the Imperial College NHS Trust, which is a, a consortium um, of our local um, hospitals in West London. Next slide, please. And this is my final slide, but I wanted to tell you that um, we offer around 12 scholarships every more every year for our master's programmes. So they're called the Dean's Master's Scholarships. And we also have the Presidential Scholarships for students of Black Heritage. We'll hear a bit more about these scholarship themes later in this event when we talk about funding. And I'd also like to promote the Revolutions in Biomedicine Summer School, um, which is in fact the funding source for a number of these scholarships. Um, we'll be opening um, applications for the summer school uh, in December. And if you look very carefully on the left hand of that slide, you can see me in a pale pink shirt holding up a model brain. That's the kind of fun we get up to on the Revolutions in Medicine uh, Summer School. Um, so thank you for listening. Um, I'm going to hand back to my colleague Aki Buluela for the next part of the presentation. Thanks so much, Jeffrey. That was uh, a, a comprehensive overview of postgraduate study opportunities in, in the Faculty of Medicine at Imperial. So what I want to do now is just to spend a few minutes really to introduce to you our, our new Medical Research Council doctoral training programme that we call MultiSci. Um, if I could move on to the next slide, please. So the MultiSci programme is uh, a new and innovative doctoral training program. So like in common with all doctoral training programmes, what we seek to do here is to recruit a number of students annually to join the programme, ultimately with a view that these students will be doing PhDs with us. And in doing so, we fully fund these students. And I'll talk a little bit about what the levels of funding are. But we fund them in terms of their stipends as well as their, their fees and so on. But we provide them with extra high value support so that they're in a good position to leave the programmes to start the careers that they want. And those are not necessarily academic research careers. Uh, I must stress that from the start. Um, the, currently, the, the call for our current program is open for for this for this next intake. Uh, that will close on the uh, on the 16th of November. So please, if you feel that you are uh, interested in our program, um, then please look at our website and 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 um, get engaged with the application process itself. Um, if I can move on to the next slide, please. So, what is in Novel and, and really quite important about the multi site program is that it isn't an entry point into a PhD, it's an entry point into a training that includes a PhD. And an important part of that training is a first year where we get the students to take part in a, an MRES, which gives them the opportunity to do two um, project rotations in that year. And those project rotations are designed so that the students get an opportunity to try out supervisors or even themed areas that they may be interested in doing a PhD in. So what we're doing is we're putting our students very much in the driving seat of what they want to do and how they will then go on to develop uh, the PhD themselves and in partnership with future um, supervisors. So this is a very important part in development of the way that we're now running our DTP. What we're aiming to do is we're aiming to generate and um, um, uh, young scientists equipped with 
a broad range of technical expertise that will position them well in careers that are, um, span all areas of biomedical and, bio, um, and um, health research. So it is an empowering program. Uh, we are looking for students to get engaged with projects which cross themes right across the college, so with other faculties. So good examples would be projects which involve our engineers, our chemists, um, our health um, scientists in the School of Public Health, and so on and so on. So we're looking at broad um, um, uh, engagement across the, the college itself. Another key aspect of the program is that what we've embedded in the program is a, a, a senior teaching fellow whose role, and I will introduce um, the, the fellow to you later, the role is to make sure that the students on the program have direct support at all stages of engagement in this program. And that includes um, um, making decisions about how they might want to go about uh, getting into certain areas of research, how they then go into the PhDs, how they uh, are able then to engage with the, uh, the milestones that lead ultimately to uh, the, the latter stages of the PhD and ultimately um, decisions to do with career development and so on. So this is a really novel feature of our program to have that level of engagement for somebody so close to the students themselves. And we've taken our first cohort of students in just this year. They've just started on the Emory's here and it all seems to be working out very well. If I can go on to the next slide, please. Okay, the um, program itself is looking to recruit students into three key areas, which really represent um, fundamental strengths in, that we have in Imperial. The first is uh, what we call the battle against infections. Uh, the second is understanding disease mechanisms in humans. And finally, uh, we have a, a, a theme which is all about big data realizing the power of big data to improve health and one of the key um, things around that is is that we also have an imperial and academic health sciences center which crosses a number of hospitals that we are involved with and that gives us access to patients and patient um, um, data that uh, is on a scale that really isn't available and very many other institutions in the united kingdom and as a result a lot of our big data projects exploit that data, which is really rather unique. Uh, if I can go on to the next slide, please. So an essential feature of the multi-slide program is that when I say to you Imperial College, you probably always think about the South Kensington campus, the, the campus that's next to the Science Museum uh, in Exhibition Road. What we've done um, comparatively recently is invested uh, over two billion pounds in developing a campus at White City, which is a campus that, that is unique in that it positions now a lot of our scientists alongside the local community, as well as developing in businesses, entrepreneurship activities, and um, various pharmaceutical and uh, drug development companies that have also built offices at the same site. So now we have a campus which is a direct interface with, um, with industry and um, commercial enterprise. Um, very close to that is the uh, campus that I work on, which is the Hammersmith campus, and that is where a lot of our uh, uh, academic health sciences um, uh, research goes on. So yeah. we have a lot of our clinicians working there and doing um, uh, a lot of really interesting research there. And finally, of course, we have the South Kensington campus, which many of you, as I say, will be familiar with. And there's a lot of uh, easy mobility between these sites. Uh, some of it yeah. walking distance and others, there's, um, there's good um, 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 buses that we have, uh, uh, a minibus um, service that's between the campuses. OK, if I can move on to the to the next slide, um, this is really just to to, to to be clear about how we how we fund um, what we're funding. We can take overseas students onto our program, so uh, a third of our students uh, can be overseas, so non UK students, and uh, that is something that we seek to do when we recruit. Um, the fees that we will pay are at home fee levels. So we're not able to pay the overseas fee and um, 
what we have is various mechanisms to, to try and meet the difference between the home fee and the overseas fee on behalf of the students. Uh, we provide a, a stipend of very close to 20,000 a year uh, and we pay that stipend in the MRES year and right the way through the PhD. The minimum PhD requirement at Imperial is usually three years. For the PhD students at all multi-side, they're funded for three and a half years. So we give them six months extra funding so that they, uh, they can very easily fit in not only the writing up, but the opportunities to take other activities that the programme funds. Internships is a very good example. And so we encourage the students on the programme to find internships while they're in their three years to help them with their career development. And as a result, our students leave and go into all sorts of um, careers as a result. They go into public policy making, they go into national, they go into pharmaceutical companies, they go into industry as a whole. Some of them become entrepreneurs and start their own businesses. And of course, a number of them do go on to, form, uh, go on to, to um, pursue academic careers. The uh, the uh, the research is uh, is supported by a small amount of money that goes to the lab that uh, hosts the students, and then we provide uh, a core amount of money that we uh, will allow the students to use to to travel to international uh, to sorry to to meetings national and international, and our supplement fund allows to extend on that. So we have students who regularly go abroad to present their data and then use the fact that they're uh, in North America or in Europe or even as far as Australia and actually uh, use that as a base to then visit other laboratories, again, with a view to developing their careers. So it's an all encompassing and, and, and very um, uh, supportive program. And finally, just to add uh, just one more bit of information, uh, we seek to try and convert as many of our projects when the students get to PhD to what we call CASE, which means a formal uh, association with a commercial partner, which increases the stipend, brings extra value into the into the uh, the laboratories, but also it makes it a clearer route for students that are interested in moving into a commercial sector. OK, I think that's really all I have to say about the multi site program. Um, I think uh, now I'd like to hand back to to Jeffrey. Now, uh, originally in your programs, you would see that uh, Tom Pearson was going to talk to this and Tom is our head of student financial support. Unfortunately, Tom is unwell today, so he's not able to attend. So Jeffrey's very kindly um, uh, offered to take over um, the presentation of what Tom wanted to talk to you about today. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Thank you, Larky. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? <clears throat> Um, so um, just to summarise what we'll be talking about, I need to warn all of you who don't live in London how expensive it is to live here and what kind of budgeting you need to think about. Um, and then I can tell you about the types of funding and scholarships we have available um, and also some useful links um, to external sites of more information about funding. Next slide, please. <coughs> Um, so the bottom line on this slide is that it will cost you around £19,000 a year to live in London. You can see how that's broken down and students sometimes say, oh, well, I'll manage this by living outside London and just travelling in from my parents' house, perhaps. Um, I would advise any student thinking about doing that to think very carefully. You don't want to be paying full time fees. Or collecting a full time bursary and then becoming a part-time student. I don't think you'd get the full imperial experience. But of course, if you come to study with us, your personal tutor or your supervisor can discuss ways of managing um, how you, <clears throat> your, your time on the imperial campus. But 19,000 pounds a year is the thing to remember. Uh, next slide, please. So if you're going to fund your postgraduate studies, um, you can get a master's loan or a PhD loan from the UK government if you're a home student. All students are eligible to apply for um, scholarships and I've put the names of those scholarships up on the slide. <clears throat> so we have some central scholarships, we have some departmental scholarships and we have some that come from research councils. <clears throat> 
Next slide, please. Um, there are government loans um, for home fee paying students. So these are available to you, whether you are taking a master's course or a PhD course. Um, the doctoral loan is worth nearly £30,000. That's over three years. And the master's loan is just around 11000 <clears throat> The problem with that is that the master's loan might not cover the full cost of your course. I'm very sorry, I'm having problems with my voice, so if you excuse me for a moment, I need to get some water. Thank you. I think that's better. Um, you don't have to repay these loans until you reach the threshold of your earnings. So if you're earning over 21,000, you will start repaying the loans. <clears throat> so if you were earning 22,000, you would pay 6% of 1,000 pounds. So that's how it would work. If you've already got an undergraduate loan from the UK government, of course, your debt will be higher. And many students, understandably, don't want to take a master's loan when they've already had an undergraduate loan to pay off. So in a moment, I'll tell you some things that you might be able to do about that. Um, next slide, please. So within the Faculty of Medicine, we do have some scholarships for master's students and the applications for those will open in December. Closing date is April. And we have up to 10 awards that pay up to £10,000. That is not the full cost of the fee for all of our programmes, but it's a substantial proportion of the fee for most of our master's programmes. The Gina Lero Scholarship pays the full fee. So if the cost of your master's programme was 18000 and you got the Gina Lero Scholarship, then you would have all of that paid. And we have up to three of those awards every year. Next slide, please. Um, we also have across the college, and this is all faculties operate the president's PhD scholarships. So um, across the four faculties of the college, there are 50 scholarships, and we have a proportion of those for the Faculty of Medicine. These are very generous. You can see there that they pay you living cost of around 23,000 a year. Um, they pay your full fees for your PhD programme and you get a consumables grant. And there's also um, the graduate school um, treats the president's scholars as a cohort and you have events that are tailored just for you. I'm not going to pretend that this is um, an easy scholarship to get. There's only 50 across the whole um, college. Many hundreds of people apply, it's very competitive, but you've got to be in it to win it. And I encourage anyone who thinks that, you know, they are of the right calibre, the right fit for a, um, one of our PhD programmes um, to apply for one of these scholarships. Next slide, please. Um, so these are decided in batches. Um, so we have um, a November batch um, we then have a second wave um, in January and then a third wave in March. So you can apply um, at successive deadlines and the final notifications are sent out in May. Next slide, please. Um, to be eligible, we are looking for very competitive candidates. So first class degree or an equivalent. Um, and if you've got a master's qualification and that is what you are offering um, as your chief qualification, uh, you must have a distinction or you must have some kind of reference or evidence that would suggest that um, you know, you're on course for a distinction. Because at the time of year you apply, if you're in the middle of a master's programme, you probably won't have your results yet. Next slide, please. Um, 
and that point about overseas students. We do have a guide online that helps you decide whether your qualification is equivalent. Um, so, um, you um, you don't have you. We judge these on the basis of the application you make. So you will apply for the PhD program. If you wish to be a, to apply for the scholarship, you can tick a box saying yes, please. You will then be asked to upload a separate personal statement, and that personal statement should focus on how the scholarship will help you um, achieve your career goals and aims. Um, and you will, of course, need some academic referees for that. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we do have some other scholarships at Imperium. Um, one is the presidential scholarships for students of black heritage. If you're thinking of coming to do a master's program with us, then um, you need to know about this. Um, again, it's quite a generous studentship, so it will pay your home tuition fee up to 18 1500 and we don't have a program in the faculty that costs more than that so if you were doing the MRes biomedical research for example the fee for that is 18.5 you will then get a stipend which is um quite generous and you'll get um an allowance to pay for equipment towards your research and the applications are open until may um we usually tell the successful candidates by July um, if, if we want to make them an offer. Um, and we have a scholarship search tool, as it says there. Um, I think we could probably put that URL in the chat so that you can click on that um, to have a look at it. Next slide, please. Um, overseas students might be thinking, well, how does any of this apply to me? You've been talking about um, some of the internal funding. The resident scholarship for PhD students, where we have 50 across the whole college, that's open to any student, international or home. Um, do have a look at the British Council website um, because that has some information about funding available to you, depending on your country of origin. And also Study UK. Um, and we can go further down. Um, we do have some collaborations um, that allow us to fund these scholarships. So we have some Commonwealth scholars every year, some Marshall scholars, some China scholarships. Um, and again, information about those is available on our website. Next slide, please. Um, I will talk about this Black Bullion program in just a moment. I want to say that there is not really a portal that summarises all of the funding opportunities for um, every type of international student, but the British Council website is a good place to start. Um, we've been encouraging our students to use this. Um, it's called a financial education platform. So it's designed to help you manage your money a bit better as a student. Um, I must confess, some students say to me, I can't manage my money when I don't have any money. Um, so that is one common uh, response I have about this programme. But I've clicked through this myself and I, and I think it makes quite sensible suggestions, things that are not you know, obvious. And, and, I, and I think anyone would learn something by using Black Bullion. Next slide, please. Um, if you are at Imperial, then our financial support for students, our central financial support is actually, I would say, very generous. So we ask students before they come to state that they have enough funds to cover all their, their studies, you know, to the end of their course, whether that's their master's or their PhD. We know, however, that unexpected things happen. Life happens, the cost of living goes up, inflation changes. Um, so um, students at Imperial are welcome to apply for support from our um, financial support scheme and the email address for that is there. Um, there's also something called an alternative guide to funding. You can probably find this by looking on the web, but it's a way of, um, it lists charities and foundations and companies that are sometimes prepared to 
um, sponsor a student or to make a grant or a loan to them. And often it's not an enormous amount of money, but it can be, you know, 500 pounds here or there, a thousand pounds here or there that can really make a difference if you're struggling. Um, and if you were at Imperial and you found yourself in financial hardship, there's no shame asking for help. We do encourage you to talk to your departmental administrator or your supervisor or your personal tutor. And of course, you can apply to the Student Support Fund. Next slide, please. And this is uh, my last slide. Um, and again, those links we can put into the um, Q&A box for you um, to avoid you the pain of typing all that out, um, particularly if you're interested in Imperial College and in home student sources of funding. Um, so thank you very much. I'm going to hand back now to Lackey um, to chair the rest of the programme. Hi, Lucky. Uh, you're muted at the moment. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. Um, that was a very comprehensive um, overview about, um, about um, student and debt management using terms of scholarships and so on. Of course, um, there's plenty more information out there in terms of the, uh, of the, of the various websites. And uh, I would refer the students to the um, I think Imperial website that links to this information and, and indeed provides more information through links on those courses um, as well as additional funding information. So thank you so much for that. Okay, so we're now going to, to move on to um, panel session, which I think is probably the most important session of today, actually. So it's an opportunity uh, for us to uh, try and answer questions that are coming in. Yep. So the, I can see that the uh, Q&A um, uh, boards are going quite well and we're getting some questions in and a lot of those are being answered uh, as as we as they've been coming in and as we speak, but we may pick up on, on a few themes coming from that in, in our discussion. So what I'd like to do is to introduce the panel, please, uh, to you now. So first of all, uh, you've uh, you already know Jeffrey, Jeffrey Vernon. So Jeffrey is the uh, principal teaching fellow and faculty uh, senior tutor uh, for the faculty of medicine. If I can now introduce to you um, Dr. Hannah Maud. So uh, hi Hannah. So Hannah is. Um, completed her PhD as a, a student funded by the MRC doctoral training program and has now um, stayed at Imperial where she is um, developing her career as an independent uh, researcher. Uh, then uh, we're also joined by, uh, by Professor Kevin Murphy. Hi Kevin. So Kevin is a professor of endocrinology and metabolism at Imperial. He um, is experienced um, in the capacity of what we call a director of postgraduate studies, which means he looks after uh, the administrative side and support side of PhD students for a number of departments within the faculty. But uh, also what's really important is, is that Kevin is also a, um, on the leadership team for the MRC DTP multi-site program with myself and, and other colleagues from across the college. So thank you, Kevin, for coming today. Uh, we have uh, Sasha Pokroskaya. Sorry, I've, I've mispronounced your name, Sasha. So Sasha has completed a, a, a master's, an MSc in translational neuroscience at Imperial. Uh, she's in the process of just staying um, in the brain sciences department, but uh, is thinking about moving on to do a PhD. So Sasha will give us a perspective from her side. Um, we have Georgia Simmons, and Georgia is a MRC DTP funded students are currently in the program. Uh, she is on a project that is a cancer project, a breast cancer project, which also involves AstraZeneca. So this, so Georgia is supported by a, um, by what we call one of these case studentships, which involves a commercial partner. Hi, Georgia, thank you for coming. And then um, we've got uh, Yoram Posman. So Yoram is a, a colleague is senior lecturer in the Department of Metabolism and Digestion and Reproduction. Uh, he's uh, particularly interested in using omic types of data in his work. 
Uh, but Yoram is very experienced as an interviewer for the MRC DTV. So any questions about interviews and so on, I think Yoram will be happy to um, help with that. So I and finally, uh, near finally, um, we've been um, very happy to say that we've joined uh, at a um, very short notice by, Pro by Professor Hector Kern. So Hector is a professor in biochemistry and he is now also the Faculty of Medicine Lead for postgraduate degrees. So he has oversight of all of our masters and MRS courses and how we're supporting our students. And I've already mentioned that we have a uh, teaching fellow embedded in the um, the MRC DTP program, the multi-site program, and that's Elena Magin. So Elena's joined us today as well. So if there are questions specifically about um, the multi-site uh, program, maybe we can address them in, 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 our, in our discussions now, but uh, Elena will be more than happy to get back to students if they've got specific questions that come up in the chat. And I noticed that you've already answered a couple already, Elena. So thank you so much. OK, so that's our panel. Um, I'd like to really sort of kick off things by uh, by um, asking a few questions based around questions that we'd already been sent in in advance of today's um, today's event. Um, so I really wanted to start by really getting uh, Hannah, Sasha, and, and Georgia involved with 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 some of the discussions we were just about to take up. And the the first I really wanted to do was to um, bearing in mind your experiences, and I, I know that. Um, all three of you actually have done degrees at Imperial and then uh, and then stayed on to do uh, to do PhDs. Um, what advice would you give to someone applying for a master's or a PhD course from your perspective? What things should they be weighing up? Um, do one of you, any one of you want to kick off with that? I can start. Uh, so I suppose from my perspective, something that's very important is to have a clear vision of why you want to do a PhD. So um, it's it, it's better to have an idea of what you hope to gain from it, to be to understand what it involves rather than just doing a PhD because you're finishing an undergraduate and it seems like the natural next step. So um, when I was applying, for example, I made sure that I'd experienced research before in some context, so by um, through summer internships. And I'd also spoken a lot to current PhD students to get a perspective of what day to day life actually involved and had a clear vision of why I wanted to do the PhD, what I hope to gain from it. And I think that definitely helps. Yeah, and I think it's also it's quite important to. And I think, you know, you may have um, something to say about this. It's quite important that you, you, your plans can be fluid. You know, at the beginning of your PhD, you may have certain aspirations and goals that you want to go to, but very close to the end, those may be somewhat different. Um, and that's fine. I don't think anybody should be considering that that you should be on a, a one track kind of training here. Um, how, how do you feel about the kind of training that Imperial offers in the way of uh, skills training, other training, stuff coming through the graduate school. How do, how does that help prepare you for, for things? Um, Georgia, do you want to? Yeah, I can um, maybe help with that because I've done quite a lot recently. Um, so this year, and I think it might be the first year it's been implemented for my year group because I'm a second year PhD. Um, we did the attributes and um, Aspirations. Aspirations, thank you, because I forgot the AA course, um, which is centered around uh, career development and also other translatable skills um, that you pick up during your PhD to prepare you for next steps. And um, whilst you're like really in your PhD, like in the middle of it, sometimes you forget that thinking about next steps is also something that you should be doing. So it's really um, helpful to have that halfway through. And some of the topics we covered was also like time management and um, being able to say no to certain opportunities to um, uh, like better help yourself in your PhD. And yeah, there was a very healthy section on career development as well. And then um, another part of studying at Imperial is that we have to do, um, so we have these milestones throughout our PhD, um, normally at the end of every year that you have to do before you progress into your next year. And um, in order to get that progression, you have to undertake um, 
uh, a certain number of professional development courses supplied by our graduate school. Um, and these cover, again, a range of courses that are really helpful to do. Um, and you need to get just a couple of credits just to pass that milestone. And um, yeah, this year, I can't remember what I did. I did um, graduate training um, so that I can become a GTA, so I can help with um, some of the undergraduate teaching courses. Um, and again, like lab supervision skills. So yeah, there's a lot that's available to you in addition to training for your PhD. Sasha, you, you would have done something similar on the master's courses. How, how do you find that the skills trainings are going? We call it skills training, but it's really giving you an opportunity to learn about other things outside the course. Um, how did you find that work for you? Definitely, it was very useful, um, especially the research uh, project that they offer on the course. So I did MSc Translational Neuroscience. So uh, having the opportunity to do a six months long uh, you know, essentially placement uh, in a real research environment was very helpful and it really uh, accelerated my learning uh, and I was exposed to all sorts of techniques and uh, yeah, the staff and the researchers really are really encouraging and they really encourage you to learn and you can get exposed to a lot more than what just one project offers because you can always, you know, arrange um, shadowing or any kind of experience opportunities outside of your research group but with other groups so it's very good very helpful that's good that's good and in terms of um and in terms of um you're you're effectively taking a year out i've noticed actually a trend i suspect it's kind of more a notional trend but i'm when examining students on, on, on master's courses, both at Imperial and outside Imperial actually, I'm beginning to see more students who want to take a year getting some extra research experience before committing themselves to doing a PhD. Um, do you, any of you have any comments about that? About I, would, I, I don't really want to call it a gap year. It's a year where students are engaged in research, it's just they're not necessarily enrolled for a PhD quite yet. And that's a conscious decision. Um, do the three of you want to just comment on that? Maybe I can also add to what I said before. So I find it very useful, you know, to have the opportunity and to have that time to speak to other supervisors, not just the one that I'm currently working with, to again get more experience because three years is really not that long. So uh, it's good to, you know, get familiar with techniques, get familiar with the topic before you actually start uh, the course itself. C certainly doctoral training programs to value very much the experience that students come with. And um, if some of that experience is because they've taken a gap between the degree that they've just done and then moving into doing a PhD, uh, that's actually value actually. Really good to hear. Um, fine. I, I, actually, just one more question from a student perspective, and I think we're probably going to get asked this. And actually, I, I will probably go straight over to Yoram after asking this. Is which is, uh, what do you perceive as the key attributes that panels look for in prospective applicants? When you were, can you think back to when you were applying to uh, uh, to, to PhDs or pro, you know the masters programs? What do you think we were looking for? Um, for me, I think it was enthusiasm. I think that's a really key part because PhDs are long um, and I think a lot of people are coming either straight from their undergraduate or their master's where research projects have been anywhere from three to six months and in the terms of a PhD that's a really short amount of time. Um, mm. So it's important to have that enthusiasm um, and really love what it is that you want to do. Um, so for me, I think that's that's really key. Yeah. OK, so maybe I can just uh, actually go straight to Yoram now and then we can open up discussion around that. So Yoram, I'm going to ask you, you know, as somebody sitting on the other side of the table and interviewing our students, um, first thing is how, how do you think is the best way to show your enthusiasm if you're interested in in some research? 
I think the, the the point is to to give examples of of why you are interested in something. So rather than saying I I like to do this, to give an example from experience. So what have you done before during a smaller project? So Georgia mentioned this. A PhD is a lot longer than anything you've done so far, but there's a lot of skills that you might have picked up in an undergraduate research project or a postgraduate research project that really translate. So I think. To give examples of what you've done so far and what you enjoyed from it, and as well maybe things that you didn't quite enjoy or did you find uh, more challenging. So I think these are things to show that you've really thought about what you what you are interested in and how you see that going further. Yeah, no, no, that's 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 very good. If we could, if I could just start with you and, and, and invite actually comments from just everybody who's on the panel. Um, it's, a, it's a very broad question because it's how long is a piece of string, but how much detail should be included in the CVs of applicants? Um, Joram, do you have any, any so, advice on this? I mean, I mean I've, I'm a relatively junior academic, but I will be able to fit my CV quite comfortably on two pages and if I must on one page. So think a little bit on the attention span of people reading this. If I have to read six pages of every little thing that first people have done, I might not be able to get to the end. So think about also what is important for what you're applying for. So if you're applying for a PhD and you're mentioning you have a driver's license and uh, you speak seven other languages and this is not relevant for that particular PhD, you might want to leave those things out. And at the same time, think about including things on your CV that you want to highlight and that you can also reflect and, and add more in a personal statement to that. So I tend to look at a CV and a personal statement side to side. So what skills do the students say they have on their CV and what evidence do they give or how do they talk about it in their personal statement? Brilliant, I think that's right. Um, Hector and um, uh, Jeffrey and, uh, and Kevin, you, you have any comments on CVs? What do you think um, can, should be included? What should be excluded? Jeffrey. Um, something, this may surprise students listening to the call, but I see some CVs that are not up to date. So a student who I know has is about to finish their degree or they're about to finish their master's programme, there's nothing actually on the CV about the project they've been doing or the supervisor they had or the kinds of questions that they were studying. It's, it's as if they're a bit embarrassed by their own studies. Um, some of these CVs have plainly not been updated for a while. So there's a lot of information about their high school experience. So do make sure that your CV is up to date and that it's talking about things you are doing currently. Um, that will make it easier for people to judge what kind of trajectory you're on. Yeah. Um, one thing that I'm really not very keen on is actually photographs in CVs. I, I don't really think they add any value at all, but um, and I think if you if you are insistent on putting a photograph, then I think be very careful about which photographs you use. <laughs> I don't know if uh, Kevin and Hector, you've got any opinions on, on, on this? I, uh, I, I mean, I guess you, you've got the CV for a purpose and the purpose is to get you an interview or get you a job or get you a studentship. So actually looking carefully at what they're looking for and then putting that stuff that proves you have those qualities at the top. Yeah. You know, even if it's a summary where you say, and I've got this skill and that skill and experience of that, and then you can reiterate them further down. But if somebody's flicking through 100 of these things, you want to make sure you cut to the chase and tell them why you're the right person. Yeah. So I think um, all of us here are involved with doing research at some level at Imperial or aware of the research at Imperial. A question that came in actually, which I thought was a very good question is, is that, is there really a lot of collaboration between researchers at Imperial? Now I'm talking about the college. So maybe some of you can comment on that, perhaps even anecdotally, in your own experiences or what, what evidence you see. Who wants to kick off on that? Hector. Yeah, like I'll say, yeah, I think what it's one of the great strengths actually of Imperial is that um, even though we're a faculty of medicine, many of the projects you'll see on offer on our postgraduate courses will be collaborations with other parts of the college mm -hmm. uh, and indeed across departments within the faculty of medicine. Um, it's one of the things we pride ourselves on is giving the student a sort of multidisciplinary you know, research experience. Um, and you know, I think it's one of the things that having such a, a large research intensive university gives you the opportunity to do that. 
And so we're often seeing projects that blend exciting areas. And it's often where the most exciting research is happening, actually, is at that um, disciplinary interface. So that certainly comes through in, in the kind of postgraduate study you can do at Imperial. Um, and indeed, you know, um, in addition to the multi site program, many of the other PhD doctoral training programs that exist uh, within the faculty put a big emphasis on multidisciplinarity. We might give it different names like the convergent science and other things. That's a, that's a term we're using quite a lot in in the um, uh, cancer research centres and doctoral training programmes we work in there. Um, but we're always looking for opportunities to work um, at uh, multidisciplinary interfaces and that you know, necessitates lots of collaboration um, yeah. between colleagues across the faculty. Yeah, I think an important embodiment of this actually is actually the White City campus because they're physically now. We have um, people from the Faculty of Medicine clinicians as well as us, uh, the non-clinical academics with groups alongside the engineers, the the chemists, the mathematicians. So you know, so it's 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 really lovely to see that because I think with physical proximity comes about new. Um, um collaborations uh, and, and i think it's a lovely thing to see actually um, and i think that we're going to see a lot of that growth in those areas okay if we could then on. um kevin we've got um some questions which is really uh kind of maybe you could you could you could start on which is really uh the first question is uh, the, um your student that's the question early 40s would a younger student be preferred a preferred choice when recruiting for a PhD program? Uh, no, not at all. I think uh, I think we're very conscious that people come from very different backgrounds. People have very different kind of times of life where they've had opportunities to do education. So I think really what we're interested in is getting the when we talk about the right students and the right skills, we're not really looking at age or, of course, gender or ethnicity or these kind of things. We're really looking at the, you're, you have the kind of qualities that we're looking for and you have the, the scientific background that we're looking for. And we we certainly have um, interviewed students across a very wide age range for positions on the, on the scheme previously. Mm. Um, another question I think about, you know, about joining us and it is a question that came up in, in a couple of flavours, which is about undergraduates that feel they don't have degrees in the areas that they're asking to do the masters in. So are we always looking for undergraduate students who've done sim the similar kind of themed areas to the masters or are we capable of taking unrelated? Uh, so I, I mean, masters are much more specialist than undergraduates tend to be. And so this is the point at which people tend to specialise. So you you need a you know so, some some scientific training there before um and so we're generally not looking for people with arts undergraduate studies um but then most of those people don't go into masters in 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 biosciences anyway but yeah i think we very much understand people change direction a bit but it, it's not just i mean my my undergraduate degree is in zoology and then my phd was in endocrinology it didn't really have a lot of connection it's just that what that's what i kind of got interested in research wise and moved into and i'm sure lots of academics and phd students have similar types of pathways mm. um, and, um, yeah and sorry so uh, lucky can i just come back on that point i just want to highlight one particular area where this is is quite important is is um the fact that a lot of biological research these days requ you know, is, it requires expertise in computation or mathematics or statistics and biostatistics as well as an increasingly um, input from engineers and chemists so actually you'll see on a lot of our programs we are taking uh, often people with a physical sciences background and giving them more biological training or people with biological training say for example on the cancer informatics uh, mres and giving them training in computational science um, as applied to cancer research. So there are quite a few programs where we we are you know, explicitly looking for people um, to make that transition and, and the programs you know are designed to accommodate that. Yeah, I, I think I mean, Joram, you obviously must have um, experienced people, researchers from purely mathematical backgrounds coming in and wanting to learn about biology, right? Uh, 
Yeah, so I'm, I'm just for everyone on the call, so I'm, I'm the co-lead of the data science stream in the um, biomedical research MRES and in the application. So two, three years ago, we had people who came from maths, from physics. Um, there was a chemist or a few chemists. There were people biological science. There was an actuary. There was someone who studied psychology before uh, as well. There were engineers, computer scientists. So really from all, all different sides. In if I look at myself, I started in chemistry and engineering, and in the end, I moved into data science from that, uh, that end as well. So I think logically people move throughout their careers as well, and you just need to find what you're really interested in uh, to really see how much effort do you want to put in each of these things. But as Hector said, it is nowadays quite important to have at least an understanding of that uh, data and computational side. Yeah. Uh, and Sasha, I know that in brain sciences, there's a lot of interest in artificial intelligence and machine learning. I don't, I don't know if that impinges on the kind of work that you're going to be doing, but that's a, that's a relatively high profile area for them, isn't it? Definitely, and it's great that for this year's cohort, they've actually introduced a general introduction to computational neuroscience uh, module. So for my cohort last year, we it was only an optional stream. Uh, but now it's actually they provide some basic fundamental training in computational neuroscience and programming languages such as MATLAB um, for everyone. And then you can obviously decide depending on what you want to do in the future. But again, a lot of uh, projects and a lot of supervisors, you know, are willing to make uh, your research experience as computational as you want it to be, essentially. Brilliant. OK, so um, moving on, a uh, question really uh, for really Jeffrey and, um, and, and Hector can certainly uh, help us with this, which is, do you need to have uh, an interview in order to apply for a master's degree at, at Imperial? So is our interviews compulsory and how, how do we go about doing interviews if the courses are requiring them? Shall I go first, Jeffrey? I, I, so it, interviews are certainly not compulsory. But, um, uh, and I, 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 you, uh, but it does vary from program to program. Um, uh, the uh, the candidates who will get an interview. Um, uh, certainly, I think it probably. Did, I would say that largely the minority probably get an interview, but certainly for those programs where we're very highly oversubscribed, you may get an, get more likely to get an interview. Um, just as we it becomes harder to distinguish um, just on the CV. Um, you know who who are the 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 best candidates for for, for the program. Um, uh, so no, you won't necessarily get one, but it it's it's become increasingly common, and it it simply actually gives you an opportunity to to get, show what you know and show talk about what you've done um, uh, more directly to the to the program uh, uh, organisers. Jeffrey, I don't know if you want to add to that. I mean everything you've said is right, Hector. I mean the capacity of the masters programmes is between. 30 and around 70 a year. So the programmes have different capacities. And I think if you were applying late in the cycle, and here were five very good applicants, you know, they, and they only had one place left, then you might be asked to interview. That would always be online if you were not able to come physically. So we can, we don't insist that you turn up physically for the interview if that if that's required. But it's not um it's it's not the normal. It's not a normal element for most of our MSc programme. Brilliant. Um, slightly connected to this, but then the area of applying for master's courses is um, are A level results considered? And if they're considered, how are they considered in applying to master's? Do, can either of you throw some insight on that? I think. Um, I may be speaking out of term. I don't think anyone looks at them. What people are looking at is your degree and what, what you're saying about yourself, whether you seem to have an interest in science, by which we mean discovery, experiments, how to plan them, problems, things of that sort. So nobody's, I think, going to look at your A-levels unless there was a gain, you know, perhaps only one place and you had two really good candidates and you wanted the A levels as a tiebreaker. Mm -hmm. It's not normally going to be something to focus on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I completely agree with what Jeffrey said. It's you know, it's it's really uh, not something we would typically look at at all. Um, uh, again, the only other sort of scenario I think it might matter if someone was shifting disciplines 
than maybe having a, you know an A level, say related mm -hmm. to biological sciences, if you were doing when went on to do physical sciences, but want to come back to a biological sciences postgraduate study, that might indicate that you have some of the background, but it really isn't something we would look at routinely at all. If if I could just um, stay on the theme of A levels, I think, and Kevin, I'm going to ask for your help on this. Is that is that for us? And now I'm talking about the multi site what we are looking at is where the students have done their A-levels because we want to widen the participation into our programme and uh, an indicator of that may be well, this, where the schools are that they're doing their A-levels at. So while we, we're not necessarily looking at the A-level grades, we will want to know something about the schooling. Uh, did you want to just maybe um, uh, expand on that slightly for us, please? Uh, I guess look, we're particularly interested um, if students went to non-selective schools with the idea mm -hmm. that they may not have had as much support um, during their schooling period. And so we tend to take that into account with a kind of holistic view of the student when we're shortlisting for interview. I think we understand that people have not all had the same opportunities. We're interested in how people have used the opportunities that they, they have had. Um, and school feeds into that. Um, I guess what I'd like to say is that the more information you give, it's not going to be used against you in any way. Where, but we are we are really interested in it and in, 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 in the idea that we can help support you better. Brilliant. No, I think that that's right, and we're very very keen to get applications from students from non-selective schools. I think that's very important to us. Um, again, now just maybe um, bring most of us back into this question. What are the uh, the top three, so maybe just a top one, things you've seen in personal statements that have stuck with you? Any way to structure the personal statement so it's got a high impact? Any tips on that? Yara. So I'm not saying you, you have to do this, but I've seen students, for example, being very interested in, in mechanisms of disease. So this is one of the themes of the multi side. And in the personal statement, they will share a personal story why they are interested. So it could be a family member or it happened to themselves. There is something there and they say, mm -hmm. this is something that happened to me and I want to contribute to, to further that. So this is something that you see from time to time. But at the same time, you do sometimes see a bit more generic uh, statements as well, um, where people say, oh, during COVID times, I saw that data science became more important. Without any elaboration, are they excited to do this or anything else? So it, it can it can go both ways, but this this is one thing that I've I've seen in those. Yeah, I would one piece of advice I would really give is make sure that your personal statement is, is relevant to the program or uh, project you're applying for. Do not write a generic personal statement that you would expect to cover you for all for all cases, because I think that's really not uh, going to work out uh, work out for you. Um, OK. Just looking at the. Um, the sorry, chat. Lucky, just on that question, I don't know if Jeffrey mm. wants to come in on something. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Yes. Sorry, I didn't know if you wanted to move off that question, Lucky. Thank you, Hector. Um, I'm always impressed if the student shows some knowledge of the kind of research that's going on in the department or the faculty and if they say you know I know I'm not guaranteed a project if I'm applying for a master's but I'd be really interested in working on this and if they've read a paper that comes out of the department or by one of the authors you know if it's clear they really have got a personal response to that and they're not just name dropping I think that's a very strong thing to include so knowledge of the research that comes out of that department or from some of the researchers involved in teaching the program. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just looking at the Q&A seems to be working very well in that most of the questions are being answered um, um, as, as we speak. I'm just scanning. There was some. Yeah, so there's a question here, which I think is actually a fair question and it's been like, which is, Will students with undergraduate degrees from Imperial be prioritised? And we could ask the same question about will students who have got master's degrees from Imperial be prioritised into the, uh, the CDT and DTP courses that we have across the college? Um, do, do we want to um, give, give, give an opinion on that, um, Hector? Yeah, I, I, I can say with fair confidence that I, you know, that 
that that wouldn't be the case that we the you know that that's all applicants are considered equally and um actually when when you look at it um because we get so many applicants from universities all over the country all over the world um imperial students end up being a minority of the students in our courses um that's just because of um the number of applicants we have from from every other corner of the globe so um no i don't think there's um, a home advantage should we say in your applications um i think when you're going on from to phd study um i think it's uh it, there is a there's always going to be in, when you're applying for a phd with a master's in hand um you know an advantage of you know people perceiving that master's degree to be of good quality that you've had good laboratory training and so if that master's degree happens to be at imperial um you will carry um uh that badge with you you know that that that's that and so it will tend to be that our um, postgraduate master students are you know, very successful at going on to do phd studies and many of them are very successful within our own dtps um i don't think that's necessarily a case of bias but i think it's a case of um having a good degree behind you with good experience and it as going to back to what jeffrey said when you're then applying for phd um mm -hmm. you can talk more knowledgeably about the researchers their work um and that that is an advantage i think when you're going for um phd uh, applications yeah so with the with the mrc dtp what we find is funny is that at the application stage we do see uh, you know um a high number it's not it's, it's certainly not a dominating number but a high number of applications from imperial students the process with the dtp is is that we take the initial application pool we then um, uh, the um, the leadership team then looks at that and breaks it down to roughly about 100 applications which go into what we call long listing and that at that point um, we um, are certainly not um, enriching for imperial students and the long listing process is that each candidate that makes the long list their their application is is then reviewed by three um, 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 scorers, academics at Imperial, right across the college. And then we use the aggregate scores plus a ranking system to then uh, decide on which students that we will call for interview. So we're breaking the 100 down to roughly 30 students so that you get a run, roughly a one in three chance of um, of getting a studentship if you make it onto that. Now, by the time we, we finish the long listing, in fact, the number of Imperial students that come through is is much 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 smaller than than we started with um simply because as you say actually um hector is that there's talent from elsewhere that we're looking at but also the criteria for get uh, for selecting students for interview isn't just simply based on uh, academic excellence we're looking for other things that those students uh, are providing information for in their applications, experience, outreach activities, um, um, interests, and, and so on and so on. And all of these get picked up in the long list scoring and add, you know, have contribute to the overall score that helps in the ranking. So um, yeah, so I, you absolutely don't need to worry if you're not from Imperial about implying, um, but take it as read, a lot of Imperial students are going to apply to our programs because they're simply at Imperial and the same will be true if you're at another university you know you're going to apply because you'll know locally that this thing is being advertised and being talking about it all the time but yeah you know that's that's fine and there was another question actually about um about uh, degree results so first versus two ones and interestingly uh, the dominant number of uh, the gra um, classification for the DTP is actually a two one and not a first so while at application stages we get a lot of first class students, again, some of those, quite a lot of those get filtered out in the process. OK, um, if we can move on really. Um, yeah, so this is this is more about our BSCs, but I guess it's it's kind of relevant. Um, is lab experience within the lab projects at the BSC level? sufficient to move straight into a PhD. So I guess the question is, do you need to do a master's to do a PhD? Is that is that really a level that you need? Because 
for example, on our on our DTP, you don't need a master's because you're, you can come, you, we're coming in and training you. But there are other PhD programs where you can apply without having a master's and you can be considered. Um, any anyone want to comment on the value of doing a master's? Oh, lots of hands. <laughs> Let's start. Can we just start with Georgia first? Do you mind, Jeffrey? And I know your hands shot up there, but, <laughs> but let's hear from Georgia first. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so I knew from doing my undergraduate research project that I wanted to do a PhD in cancer biology. That was quite fixed for me. Um, but I did the MRES cancer biology course before I started my PhD, and that was so helpful because there. It's a it's just such a massive field and there's I feel like on your academic journey, the further you go along, it often is the case that you start to realise that there's so much more that you don't know. And um, I would I completely changed what sort of cancer I was interested in and what aspect of cancer research I was interested in um, through doing the master's course. And then the other benefit of doing it is that you also get to experience a whole lot more of training. So in terms of wet lab, that's been really important to me because it meant when I started my PhD, I had a set of skills that I could just jump into and start doing research straight away and not having to do that initial training period. And then the next benefit is also getting more experiences with working with different labs and different PIs and different postdocs. Um, and networking and again it's it's one of those things where you get to speak to more people and get an understanding of what you want from your PhD so I think there's so many reasons why doing a master's is extremely beneficial before doing a, a PhD. Jeffrey I'm sure you're going to I mean, as, as George just says, you, you will just have so much more experience and so it may be easier for you to write about. What, what I would say is that whether you've done a BSc and that was the last thing you did, or whether you've done an, an MSc, I think it's very important to show what you have learned by doing that project. So if you just write down as kind of stamp collecting, oh, I did this BSc and then I did this MSc, it won't be clear to the selectors why you have a passion for science. So if you BSc was the last thing you did, make sure you squeeze out all the benefit of that BSc. What did you do in your project? Why did that fire your enthusiasm? What were you not able to achieve? You know, how has that? What has taken you from that BSc to this application you're now making? Um, so I wouldn't say it's fatal, but as Georgia says, you will just accumulate more experience by doing a master's. Sure, sure. OK, um, another question that's come up in the in the chat. Um, which we've had before, which is really centers around who who are the best people to be referees uh, to help you with your application? Um, who should our candidates be looking to? Um, anybody want to pick up on that? OK, uh, Yoram. I think the, the main thing is someone who actually can comment on who you are, what you have done. So um, the best person would be your supervisor of, of a project. It could be a, a module lead of a course you really enjoy where you've learned a lot from. Um, because it's quite important that these statements are specific to you, that they really highlight what are your strong aspects, why should a program pick you? And if it's someone who doesn't really know you well or has maybe seen you once in a year, they would only be able to write something very generally about you. And that doesn't tell anybody reading that a lot more about you than they would be able to read from a CV, for example. Mm -hmm. So think whatever more information they can give about you, your strengths, potential uh, things for improvement, that is something really good to do. And I think who knows you better than your supervisor? I think that would be the first person to go to. Kevin, I think you were going to come in on this as well, was that right? Yeah, no, I think that's right. I mean, I think I what I often what I often want to ask the previous project supervisor is if this person came to you and wanted to do a PhD, would you take them on? And if that's how your project supervisor feels about you, try and get them to communicate that to us. That you know, all of the skills you've learned, what you could do for them, 
how it's going to work, but also, you know, did they think you had this kind of, you know, this research potential in the future? Hmm. Yeah, I guess um, one of the things is, uh, and we were asked this actually the other event the other day, which is uh, what, what's worth more, a, a reference from a professor or a reference from a postdoc? Or, or is there actually materially going to be no real difference? I think, I think it's more how well they know you and what they've seen you do, to be honest, because some professors are in the lab or are very close to it and some are a bit yeah. more distant for it and don't really have a feel. I guess in the same way that from a personal statement, I want it to be personal, I want to get a feel for you. That's what I'm also looking for in the reference from somebody who knows you a bit and has seen what you can do. Sure. And so, so it doesn't necessarily matter on their grade, but I do want to feel that it's real and not not just generic and not just a string of stuff that that isn't tethered in reality. If that makes sense. Right. Um, Hector, I know that you wanted to just chip in. Yeah, you? just um, I mean that 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 point about it, someone being able to talk about your their personal experience having worked with you is 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 so important because, um, and you know some some PhD programs will ask explicitly from a referee this certain information about how does the person get on with the rest of the team you know uh, how do they how resilient are, are they when things aren't working so well you know and these kind of yeah. things if you've got somebody who can talk about you in those terms from the experience of, of supervising you um, whether that be a postdoc or a professor you know that that's really useful information I think actually you know uh, those that those kind of references are um, probably a you know a deal breaker really when it comes to some of the recruitment choices we make. Yeah, I think it's worth reminding uh, the, the candidates that um, actually for a lot of these things there are now structured uh, referees um, and they're they're they're, they're portal things you have to access online and they have a series of questions where you, you, you which are relatively simple but ones that come up very often is how long have you known this candidate. Are you able to you know, give some insight to how this, how well this can is in relation to the cohort that they're in? And of course, if you haven't, if you haven't known this candidate for very long and you have absolutely no idea of what their cohort is because, you know, the, you've known them for such a short time, you can't really fairly answer those questions. It then doesn't really matter what you write in the, the free text bit. It carries less weight. So I think it's really important to have referees that, first of all, as you say, do know about you are able to um, provide honest information about you, particularly in these structured uh, kind of scenarios. But over and above that, you need to tell referees that you're using them so that they have pre-warning that they're going to be approached because some of the emails that are sent out asking for the referees to respond can be very easily lost almost as spam. You know, they have really ridiculous titles and they come from generic service so unless you're really looking out for them you won't you won't know that the the referees are, and um requests has come in and actually there's there's never a chaser on them it's a one-off thing so i think that's really important to know i think we're, we're coming close to the end so um really i just maybe wanted to just go around um around the um the panel just really looking for um, just s maybe a few words of why you might think actually Imperial is a good place to come and do a, um, a master's or a PhD. Um, Hannah, do you want to kick us off with that, please? Yes, well, as someone who did an undergraduate master's, PhD and postdoc at Imperial. Yeah, you're <laughs> um, institutionalised. No. <laughs> yes, very much. Now, I can confirm, um, well, I, I found it fantastic. So just to give some examples, um, especially this DTP, I made use of a lot of the extra opportunities. So the conference fund, um, I had the opportunity to go to international conferences. Um, I also used the extra supplement fund to learn some extra skills, which helped me find a postdoc position. Um, Imperial has been mentioned already, but the graduate school is fantastic and really helps you build professional skills. If you don't want to go into academia, a lot of people make, make use of that and build skills relevant to, for example, moving into industry. Um, again, just to summarise what's really been said already, but the collaborations um, and not just collaboration, but networking opportunities uh, through those conferences. So I've had the opportunity to work with uh, researchers from UCL, 
um, from abroad. I now uh, work with the NHS as well on patient data. So it's just such an amazing institution um, with really arms everywhere so to provide a lot of opportunities. Brilliant. Um, Sasha, maybe you could tell us. So uh, I would focus more on the maybe supportive and encouraging environment that I found myself in uh, at Imperial. So everybody wants to, wants you to do great. Everybody is always there to help you if you have any queries or you know even just doubts. Everyone is super supportive. So the environment that you find yourself in is actually very good and very motivating and inspiring. Thank you so much. Georgia. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I think the community um, as a whole and the people at Imperial are very lovely um, in, in all aspects as well, whether that's in the lab or um, PIs, uh, but also in the administrative roles. Um, and that counts for an awful lot. Um, so yeah, that that would be my main take. Brilliant. And then going to the other side, we're talking now about uh, supervisors, I guess, and and so on. So Yoram, what do you what do you think is nice about what we offer our students? I mean, I, I think the, you know the disciplinary aspects uh, of it. That's also one of the reasons why I joined Imperial as a PhD student many years ago. Um, and, and like Hannah, I've been here for so many years since. Um, and I think that's that's a good thing that these collaborative opportunities are there that Hector mentioned, and it's also students seeking them out themselves. So as part of this program, you choose your supervisors and uh, you can pick two people who haven't ever worked together and then you can be the link and define that. And I think that's something that Imperial does allow you to do. So really to find your own niche uh, that you can uh, used to build your career after. Brilliant, brilliant. Hector. Yeah, very much just to echo what, what Joram said, you know, post postgraduate study is the place where, you know, uh, research and education really come together and sort of synergize. And when you, you've got an institution like Imperial, which has, you know, such a, a you know, a diverse and impressive you know, research community it, 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 that, that makes it a fantastic place for postgraduate study um, and when you put that together with the fact that you've got lots of staff you know the, the, the teaching fellows on 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 this call uh, you know uh, Elena and Jeffrey for example who are professionally dedicated to improving the quality of what we do as a process for postgraduate education and the student experience um, you know uh, and as well as the other academics on this call that you know um, you put it all together postgraduate study imperial will really help you become the best version of your professional and scientific self um so i you know i think it's going to be a great experience whichever course you do brilliant jeffrey um we've touched on things like the student experience and you know the students on this call have had really good experience i know some students are not happy you know it's part of my job to, to help the students who are not the point is if you reach out at imperial there is someone who can help you to get through your situation and I mean I like to do this in a kind of coaching way where we talk about the options that you have and so in the end you make the decision about how to move forward but together with the ways we've been thinking about how we deliver our teaching and our assessment I think there's quite a lot of awareness at Imperial about the student experience and the fact that you know some people need some extra help it's not positive for everyone but I think we do our best when we identify those students to to help them through their program. Thank you so much. And Kevin, finally. Uh, I guess I just like to say I, I think the vast majority of our PhD students really enjoy their time uh, here. I mean, I think it, you know it's academically very strong. It's great opportunities, but they have fun and part of being in that kind of vibrant community, which is very diverse with access to all sorts of cool equipment and expertise and other opportunities is just yeah, it's really good. I mean, I did my PhD dip here quite a long time ago now um and I'm, I'm still hanging around so yeah i, I do recommend this <laughs> that's brilliant you know i think one selling point that we never make enough of is uh the fact that our uh, main campus at south games and always has an ice cream van outside it which, which I'm, I'm always impressed by okay so just in closing can i just uh, say that um, it's been a pleasure uh, talking to you all today and with you all today and i hope the students that have been on the call today have uh, benefited, but the entire thing is being uh, uh, videoed and it will be put onto the uh, 
think of your website and then everybody that registered for this will be sent links to it. And so the, everything that we discussed today will become widely circulated. Uh, I just wanted to thank um, Shala, uh, Nasheen and Natasha uh, for the hard work that they've put in making sure that today's event has gone through. Um, and to Daniel for uh, overseeing the entire thing and uh, making sure that the broadcasting of this, including my muted uh, microphone, uh, were, were, were corrected. Um, it'd be great if uh, participants provide us with the, some of the feedback from the event link, which will be sent out to you. And any questions that have come up in the Q&A that we haven't addressed, uh, we will be certainly be getting back to the um, to you uh, to answer those. And indeed, if there's any questions that you want to ask, uh, which you weren't able to ask, then please just send them to the um, Think Imperial team and then we'll make sure that you get a response from that. And finally, um, you can actually experience virtual tours of Imperial College by going to the Imperial College 360 website uh, where you can find out all about all aspects of the college. So with that, um, I think I'm going to close today's session. Uh, and once again, thank everybody that, uh, that took part. Thank you so much. <laughs>